Well, we're in our third week on fearless faith, and last week we had that that great story about the lady that had just a little bit of faith, but that was enough, and Jesus said, your faith has made you well. And this week, uh, we've got another example of uh, some great faith, and it it comes from a story you're probably familiar with. Uh, It comes from Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Let me read that for us. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why do you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are certainly God's son. Well, like I said, last week we spoke about that woman who had just a little bit of faith and was made well, and we learned that faith in Jesus is the object of all faith. Uh, We we trust in him, we depend on him, and that's what it means, in essence, to believe or to have faith. And this account of Jesus walking on water and Peter walking on water demonstrates demonstrates that truth I think in just a really dramatic way. Now I want to be clear about something concerning uh, the miracle contained in this passage today because you know just to be really candid and straightforward with you you may be hearing this or watching this and and thinking well here they go again with the uh, the magic stuff and all the stuff in the Bible that just, you know, this can't be true. Nobody walks on water. And, you know, I just want to state to you that I I want to believe that Jesus walked on water, but really my faith is just, just empty talk until I'm in a boat and he beckons me to get out of the boat and walk on water. And so if you if you hear this passage and you think, well, I just can't buy this. This stuff is impossible. Then I want to give you another option this morning. You know, oftentimes on interstate roads, they will make what is is called a, uh, a frontage road. And you don't have them so much around here in Kentucky, but, but in the Midwest, they, they are all over. And they're for people who just, you know, don't need to get on the interstate. The, the frontage road runs alongside of the interstate. And, of course, they've got entrances and exits to to uh, get off or on but but it runs alongside the highway and there aren't any police on the frontage road and you know maybe if you don't want to go 80 mile an hour or if you don't want to go as far you can just you know get on the frontage road and um, Jesus and and Peter were you know if you can't say yes to them really walking on water I want to invite you today to, you know, not get on the interstate. You, I'm not trying to force you on here, but just you can just ride alongside on the frontage road for a while on this story because, you know, I believe that Jesus and Peter really did walk on water, but even if you don't, if you're not there yet to, to say that, yeah, I think that they did, that's okay because the frontage road is going the same place as the interstate is today. And you get to the same point in life. The same truth is there. And this whole thing doesn't hinge on whether you believe that Jesus walked on water or not. What it it hinges on 
is if you're, you're willing to listen to God today and what he wants to say to you through this word. So I just give you that option. This, this is not a trick. This is not a show. This is not really a miracle to prove who he is. This is a great teaching moment for Peter and also for the other 11 and I think also for us. Now, just a few things about context, about how this, where this story takes place. It takes place after a really long day, a grueling day. Jesus found out early in the morning that John the Baptist, who we think was his cousin, had just been beheaded. And so when he hears this, he, he obviously is upset about it. And, and probably, you know, he realizes that stuff is being set in motion and that his death is going to take place, just like John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist was the man that came and said that he was just preparing the way for the Messiah. He pointed to Jesus. He said, he's greater than I. He said, I have to become uh, less so that he can become more. He said, uh, he looked at him, he said, uh, behold the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And so that was his job, but when it was over, and Jesus learns of it. It says that he retreated and went to a place to pray. And see, you know, th this is another thing for us. We, we learn here that when Jesus gets some really bad news, I mean, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't get angry. He doesn't go into a why me thing. Uh, he goes away to pray. He knows where his strength comes from. He needs the word from the Father. But while he was away... The crowds find him. They, they follow him. And there's thousands of people that have come to Capernaum because it says that Jesus is performing miracles and healing them all. And so they follow him up the mountain. And when, when they get there and they, you know, here they are and Jesus says ministers to them all day. So he comes out of prayer and he ministers to the needs of the people all day. But then late in the day, the disciples come to him and they say, you know, we've got a problem. We're a long ways away from any food, and they're out here in the wilderness alone, and they need something to eat. And Jesus looks at them, and he said, well, why don't you take care of this? See, there's a test of discipleship. He, he says, you guys can do this. Well, they, they find a little boy. You know the story. They find a little boy, and he's got a you know, sack lunch with him, some sardines and some pita bread, and they take it to Jesus, and Jesus multiplies that little lunch and turns it in to feed these 5,000 men plus women and children. And we have the feeding of the 5,000, just a, a great miracle story. But after that, he sends them, that's the end of the day. Think of this grueling day. He, you know, first gets his terrible news, then he ministers all day. And at the end of the day, he sends his, his 12 disciples on across the Sea of Galilee. They're going to go over to Gadara, the land of, of of the Gentiles and for some ministry over there and it's late at night and he sends them out on the boat by themselves because he needs to go back into prayer and off they go in the boat the same boat probably that they had used before we had that other incident where remember Jesus calmed the sea he was asleep in the boat and uh, calmed the sea the, the first uh, sermon in this series and you know at the end of that they they kind of wake up and they go who is this guy you know, he's, he's not just another rabbi. Who is this? But Jesus goes back on the mountain to pray. And then in the middle of the night, he sets out to go find them. And, and they haven't gotten anywhere. It says the wind is contrary. And they've been rowing and trying to fight this wind across the Sea of Galilee. It's only about six or seven miles is all that it is to go across it. But they're not getting anywhere. And... Uh, the problem this time was that Jesus isn't in the boat with them. He had sent them on. And it says that at the fourth watch, which is uh, sometime between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., Jesus comes to them walking on the water. And Matthew says that the, the boat was battered by the waves and tormented by the waves. And the, the boat, their vessel, their vessel in life is worn out. I think it's just a great metaphor here for us is to sometimes, you know, we, we all have these days and these weeks and sometimes these months and years where we're battered by the waves and we row against the wind. We just don't feel like we're getting anywhere. And we're not sure whether God sees us or not, whether God is with us or not, because it just seems like everything is going against us. 
And that is the scene into which Jesus comes walking on the water. And it's then that, that Peter gets out of the boat and walks on the water. It's three in the morning, the sea is tossing, the wind is howling, their, their, their arms are sore, they're exhausted guys. It's been an exhausting day and now they've struggled all night. And well, can it get any worse? And in that moment, in that moment, it's when Peter decides that he's going to test his faith by putting his feet over the edge of that boat and tries to walk on water like Jesus did. And it just, you know, I mean, this is going to be a story of failure, right? Or is it? I mean, you failed, haven't you? We, we all fail at things. You've been, you've been cut from a team sometime, or, you know, you didn't make that class, you didn't make that elite group, or you let go from work, or you've been dumped or deserted by a friend, or, you know, you, you failed to hold your temper, you have had a personal failing, failed to show, forgot the date, you know, once again, you blew it. I mean, did, did you, I mean, ha haven't you said over, I can't believe that I've done this again? I mean, how many times do we say that in life? Of course you have. We all fail. All human beings fail. Listen, God didn't intend for the human being created in his image and bearing his name to go through life in a desperate attempt to never fail. That was not his design at all. In fact, if we seldom fail, means that we are so afraid, so lacking in faith that we never even attempt anything that's beyond our power and our ability and our experience. And that's not life, that's death to be there. Because failure is necessary. Failure means that we're, we're seeking to grow, we're, we're trying to, to depend upon God. There's a, a city of Ann Arbor, Michigan has a strange museum. It's, uh, it's called the Museum of Failed Products. And at first it just kind of looks like an, you're some kind of store, like a supermarket, except there's only just one item of everything in this. And you won't find these items in the supermarket anyway, not, not anymore, because they're all failures. They're all products that companies released and thought they were going to make a lot of money on and then failed miserably. Um, and this is like consumer capitalism's graveyard. It's the only place on the planet where you're probably going to find Clairol's A Touch of Yogurt shampoo. And it's right next to Gillette's equally unpopular for oily hair only shampoo. Didn't do too well, right? Uh, Pepsi AM is there you know, born in 1989, died in 1990. And so this museum is home to all these discontinued brands, things like uh, caffeinated beer, uh, TV dinners that uh, had the logo of the toothpaste manufacturer Colgate. That was kind of conflictual. Uh, fortune snookies, fortune cookies for your, for your dogs. Um, Self-heating soup cans that had a tendency to explode, stuff like that. Uh, breath mints that were packaged and looked like uh, they were packaged crack cocaine. That didn't go over so well. But if the museum has a central message, it's, it's that failure isn't a rarity. Failure is the norm. As a matter of fact, about 90% of the products never really make it. You know, 90% of the things. So, I mean, we know most of the stuff, most, most of us know the, the stories of the epic failures, you know. Um, you know, things that just never make it. So, um, you know, Steve Jobs um, gets fired by Apple and we go, how in the world could they fire Steve Jobs? Or McDonald's sells Chipotle. You know, it's like so stupid. And it's, it's easy for us to look on those things. And, and we, there's still products like, uh, did you know that WD-40, that little can of kind of miracle stuff that you spray on things that are rusted and loosens them up, WD-40 stands for water displacement the 40th time that he tried. 40 times, 40 different formulas before he got it right. So he just stuck that name on it. And of course, you probably heard the story of Joseph Salk, the, the inventor of the vaccine uh, for polio, that he failed 200 times 
200 failed vaccines. And uh, when an interviewer one time was asking Salk about that, how did it feel to fail 200 times? Uh, it's reported that Salk said something like, he said, well, that word failure, that word was never allowed in my family. And all that I found out was 200 times. He says, I never failed 200 times at anything in my life. My family taught me never to use that word. I simply discovered 200 ways how not to make a vaccine for polio. That was the way he looked at it. Let's be honest here. I mean, sitting in a boat and watching someone else sink in the water is kind of good spectator sport. That's good entertainment. I mean, e even in the church, this is entertaining. Uh, in, in fact, what we would call boat potatoes fill our, our churches because we're too afraid to risk being afraid. I mean, get, get your head around that. The normal is to do nothing. We love stories about people who fail. And we love stories about people who have courage and risk their lives. But we really, most of the time, want comfort. That's what we are looking for, is something that doesn't upset us, something where we're not a failure. We, we know how to veg out and how to chill out in the church and, and hire somebody else to do it, is, is what, we're, what, what it's come to in a lot of our churches. But fear isn't something that we can avoid because no matter what we do, there's going to be some storms. There's going to be some storms in life. The boat of our comfort is going to rock. And faith means that you're not afraid to be afraid. I know that sounds kind of weird, but we've got to get to this. Disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of Jesus Christ, are willing to fail. And they're not afraid to fail. Now, I kind of think this whole thing of Jesus walking on the water, he sending them out was a setup. I mean, it's, it's just me. I don't know. But I, I see this. This got Jesus written over this whole thing. He says, I'm staying here. You guys go on. I know it's late at night, but you guys go on without me. You see, I, I don't think that this was just circumstantial. I think that this was providential, as we would say, that this is something that God was going to use to teach them and it's it's in the middle of the night and I, I think this is one of those experiences in life that reveal what we really trust in what they really trust in the disciples are terrified and into their fear which is natural I mean why wouldn't you be afraid and Jesus speaks to them and says take courage it is I do not be afraid literally he says courage dare be bold is literally what he says to them. And I think this is a test. I really do. Will they represent him? Okay? He's giving them kind of a leadership opportunity or even a challenge. Will they handle the test of the raging sea any differently than the last time when they blamed the whole thing on him? Remember that? They said, you don't even care that we're dying out here. So, so will this be any different? And this time... I think 11 of the 12 fail the test because they're unwilling to push through this original fear. And he counters their natural fear with his word. He says, courage. Okay. Then he reveals his presence to them. He says, it's I. I'm here with you. And then with this command, he says, do not be afraid. There, there's going to be a lot of times when we are just naturally afraid of what's going on. It's normal. It doesn't mean that we're weak. But God reveals to us through his son that he's with us and there's nothing to fear. And he says to us, courage, okay, dare, be bold. And it worked for a while. First of all, 11 say nothing. Okay, there, there's going to be times. There's going to be times when we are naturally afraid. It's normal. It doesn't mean that we're weak. And eleven of these people, Peter says to them, eleven of them, eleven of them say nothing. They're they're so terrified. And Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And and Peter, you can do what I do. Is what he's saying. I'm walking on water, Peter. If you would have the courage, you can walk on water. 
Peter, I'm teaching you how to live like me. You're my disciple. The disciple follows the master. So in the same way that I do something, Peter, you can do the same thing. And it worked for a while. And then he looked at the waves. And his faith began to waver. As long as he was looking to Jesus, you see, he was fine. He was able to do what Jesus was doing. The supernatural thing. Jesus was, here again, Jesus was and is the object of our faith. There's no one else to believe in. Faith is trusting and depending on Jesus. And Peter learned that, that he, as he was sinking, he said, Lord, save me. And it says immediately he stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? How many times do we do this? How many times do we sink and say, Lord, save me? thousands, millions of times in a lifetime. We learn that daily as, as we want to look like Jesus, we want to live like Jesus, and then we look to other things. And it just takes a few minutes of distraction, a few minutes to get us off track. I mean, the, the bills that are on the table or something that happens in the world or the, the threats that, that are going on of others or our past failures or the, the struggle of just simply trying to stay focused in life and to walk moment by moment with the Lord. I mean, most of this arises from our fears. Millions of times we sink. If you get out of the boat, you never learn if you stay in that comfortable boat. But somebody's got to lead others out of the boat, you know. Now, Peter was not a failure. He walked on water. He got his feet wet. Think about that. We all think, oh, Peter, you're sinking. No, he walked on water. This isn't the story about Jesus walking on water. This is the story about Jesus and Peter walking on water. I can just hear the dialogue of the boat potatoes as they're sitting there, you know. And one of them probably goes, I was just, Peter, Peter swings his leg over the side of the boat to walk on water. And the guy goes, oh, I was going to do that. Well, we'll let him go ahead now, but I was going to do that, you know. You, you know, we used to take kids to, it reminds me, we used to take kids to Kings Island. And there would always be one or two kids who, you know, maybe they're about 7th grade or 8th grade. And, and uh, the other kids, they're riding the beast and all these giant coasters and just, you know, going at it. And, and they, I don't, I don't feel like it right now. I want to go do something else. And then you tell them, hey, we'll meet you at the Eiffel Tower at 7 o'clock to go home. And they show up about 15 minutes early. And they go, Pastor, could, could, you, could you wait? Because now I want to go ride the beast. Okay? They've been there all day, and they didn't have courage all day. And now that the time's over, and they've watched their friends have fun, because the friends dared to do it, now they want to go ride the ride. And that's kind of the way I think about these 11 guys in the boat. And then when he sinks, you know, maybe, maybe one of those, those guys, you know, I could, I could hear our dialogue. Uh, Peter starts to sink, and the guy goes, I told you so. I, I knew he couldn't do it. You know, There's always those people around, too. They're just observers, is all they are. At the end, they worship him, and they say, you know, certainly he is the Son of God. But only one of them, Peter, knew that if he looked to Jesus, that he could do the same things that Jesus was doing, that Jesus would empower him to represent him, that he could really be a disciple. And only Peter knew what it was to really be a follower. The disciples uh, that day, uh, because only Peter got his feet wet, and only Peter lost his faith, and only Peter had cried out to Jesus and felt his hand save him. And the rest of him, rest of the, the 11, just had a story of something that they saw, but they never dared. They were too afraid of being afraid. Now, what would I attempt if I, if I knew that I couldn't fail? That, that question is often asked at the end of one of these kinds of stories in the Bible because it's motivational and you're thinking, boy, I'm going to do it. And, um, you know, when I used to hear this and people have a motivational kind of talk, in church and I think you know if I could if I knew that I couldn't fail I'd go out for you know uh, I'd go out for a National League baseball team and I'd because I knew I couldn't fail or I'd, I'd write that great novel you know because I knew that I'd, after all that work that somebody would buy it big things I mean 
The, the idea there is to get us to kind of push back our boundaries on life and, and try things that we would never try. But I, I want to ask a different question of you today. And I think that this question really fits with this scripture much more. How many times am I willing to fail if I eventually risk my dream? It's not what would I do if I knew I couldn't fail, but how many times am I willing to fail if I knew that I would eventually reach my dream? How worthy is our dream? How worthy uh, is it? How many times then would I fail? If it's a very worthy dream, I'd be willing to fail for years and years and years to reach that dream. See, if, if it isn't, if your dream's not that big, if your dream's not worth failing for year after year after year, then your dream isn't God's purpose. Because God's dream, God's purpose for you, is worth failing at over and over. And I think this is one of the seeds of the fear of failing, that we simply just don't understand what God wants to do through us. We just simply can't grasp that. It's just way too great. And I, I think of a prayer that Paul gave. It's in Ephesians 1, 18 to 19. I love this prayer that he gave to the Ephesians. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? Did you hear that prayer? Did you hear that prayer for them? I think it's for you. I think it's for me. I think it's for us. He prays that we would grasp the hope of what God's calling is for you. We would grasp that, the hope of God's calling on your life. I mean, we just can't grasp how big this is. He says, I want your, your hearts to be enlightened. I want you to have revelation in other words, let me speak to you about how much I intend to do in your life, what my hope is for you. Uh, Paul was saying, I, what I'm praying for you guys is I'm praying that your minds and your hearts might be stretched and enlarged so that you might be able to, to comprehend and, and to, to just grasp just how much God loves you and what he wants to do in your life. Because you cannot fail. You can't fail. This week, a, a man said something that kind of uh, took me by surprise for a while, but I, I've been digesting it, and it's, it's, it's something great. I want to give it to you today. He said that God has more faith in us than what we have in Him. At first, that just sounded impossible. Why would God need to have faith, faith in us? But when you think that faith is to trust and depend on someone, to think that for, if we are God's body, if we are Christ's body, that he is trusting us. He has trusted us with the kingdom of God. And he's depending on us. If we don't do it, it won't get done. If his body doesn't do it, it won't get done. And so he's given, given us all kinds of things he's entrusted us with. He has faith in us. He's given us his children to raise. They're not our children, those of you that are parents. These, these aren't your kids. These are God's kids that he's entrusted to you to raise. He's given you his money to invest in life for other people is what he's done with that. He's given you his name, his authority. When you walk around, it's Jesus Christ walking around. You can't fail because he's got faith in you. He's vested himself in you. He trusts you. He depends upon you. And Jesus, in essence, says, you can't fail me because I've chosen you. And I've given you my name, and you're my people, and I am with you, and I don't fail. I'm the king of the universe, and I don't feel, fail. And if we receive that, then, then we're living like, you can't fail me. I believe that, God, that you have called me to live like Jesus, and Jesus is going to live his life in me. He is the one that's going to parent my kids, you see. If I can get a hold of this, he's going to do that. He's the one that's going to manage my business. He's the one that's going to take care of my money. He's the one that's going to deal with my neighbors and my in-laws. And he's, he's, going, he's going to make a way for me where there is no way someday because 
He has faith in me. He trusts me. He depends upon me. So Jesus asked me to get out of the boat and walk on water with you. Jesus, if that's your word that's coming to me today, ask me. Ask me to get out of the boat. You, you just can't sit in the boat and watch him do it. He's going to live your life through you. You have to have enough faith to not be afraid of fear. You have to get our feet wet and be willing to fail in order for Christ to live in me. He has more faith in you than you have in Him. You know, in all of Scripture, it never says, don't fail. Many times it says, I won't fail. But He never tells people, don't you fail. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to believe that I want to live my life in you. I want to close this morning with a story about a, another guy. Um, some of you remember Gary. Gary was um, staying in the hotel here behind the church and wandered in one week, came back the next. And after about, it was two or three weeks of being here, um, during our body time, he kind of stood up and he, he made this declaration. It was uh, a little unusual, um, but he said more or less, I'm with Jesus today, is what he was saying. He was making a declaration of faith and kind of putting his flag in the, in the ground on top of the hill, you know, and saying, I'm, now, now I'm different, I'm with Jesus. And, and then he told me, he said, uh, want to know if he could be baptized. And I, you know, I said, well, yeah, you know, we, can, we can arrange that. And he says, well, this week. And I, oh, okay, uh, this week. He says, yeah, if you don't do it this week, uh, I got to get somebody else to do it because I'm not wasting any time. I want to get baptized, and he just really seemed like a man that was just going someplace. And and we baptized. And it was a fantastic event. And and then he came a couple weeks, and then he was gone. And we were all, you know, people were going, "What happened to Gary?" And you know, kind of like oh, he kind of fall off or something. And uh, I just want to fill you in on the rest of that story. I, he'll be back someday, but. Gary really is a great example of a guy who got out of the boat and realized that you have to do it now. You just can't wait. He had told me, he said, he said, Don, I, I feel like I've, I've wasted my life up to this time and the life that I have left, I'm not going to waste. I'm giving it to God all out. And a couple weeks ago, there was a message on the answer machine. It was from Gary. He said, you know, I thought I'd better tell you what happened to me. He said, uh, I'm up here in Michigan, and I'm being trained as a missionary to go overseas. And um, I'll be back here sometime, and I'll stop by and see you guys. Thank you so much for everything that you've done. Wow, you talk about uh, a man that, that grasped what it is to, to give his life, to hear the call. You know, Lord asked me to get out of the boat and and God did and he jumped out of the boat and the Lord's just going to do some great things through him amen As deep cries out